All right, I got the sign. I think we're ready to start. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Blake Bingham. I am the Assistant State Engineer over the Water Rights Adjudication Program um, in the Division of Water Rights. Uh, this is the public meeting for the Provo City North Subdivision General Adjudication. Um, just want to make sure everyone's at ease a little bit. Uh, this, this, uh, I have a presentation. We're kind of kind of cover some of the reasons why you received the notice you did, but I, I want everyone to know that if you have a question throughout the presentation, please feel free to raise your hand and, and ask the question. If it's something that's a little bit more specific to your situation and maybe doesn't benefit the entire group, I might just ask you to hold off and, and we'll, I'll stand by afterwards, and myself or my team um, can answer it later. Um, for those of you who are viewing us online, we are streaming this online, um, we'll uh, give you an opportunity to ask questions as well. This is our agenda. At the bottom of this screen, you can see it is an email address. If you're viewing this online, go ahead and email me a question, and at the conclusion of the presentation, I will uh, answer it uh, for the benefit of the audience here and the benefit of the viewing audience online. Um, we're going to, as I said, we're going to go over the adjudication overview, kind of give you a broad um, sense of what we're doing and, and why you received the notice. We're going to talk a little bit about a proposed determination. That's a, a phrase or a concept that you'll hear over and over tonight. We'll explain what that is and what that has to do with water rights. We'll talk about any significant issues and an anticipated timeline, of course, questions throughout the process. Um, I know that uh, the notice that you received had a summons involved, uh, included in it. By, that's part of the uh, statutory process for this. I apologize if that uh, was alarming. It wasn't, uh, I guess it is intended to get your attention, but if you feel like uh, there's nothing in that summons that makes, it requires your attendance here tonight. All right, so this is completely optional. You can actually view it. We're recording this. You can go home and view it uh, tomorrow after we record it online as well. So at any time, if you feel like your curiosity has been satisfied or if you just have better things to do, feel free to, to set, uh, stand up and, and make your way out. It uh, won't hurt my feelings, and I know we're all busy people and have a lot of important things to get to. So um, one other thing I wanted to cover, I uh, have a lot of my staff here to help answer questions as well. If you have a question that maybe is specific to your situation but you don't want to wait around to the end to get the answers, uh, go ahead and stand up. Just get a hold of one of my staff and they'll be able to take you out in the hallway and maybe discuss your issue private or you know in confidence or away from the, the, the audience so it's not distracting everyone. All right, I think that's all the warnings I have. Let's go ahead and, and get started. All right. So, whenever we do these public meetings, um, we usually have a, a broad array of water rights experience. And so I usually just kind of gear this towards the people who don't know anything about a water right, okay, or what a water right is. So we're going to start off with some water rights 101, first of all. And I apologize for those of you who do know what this stuff is. This is going to be a little bit of a um, redundant lesson. But a water right is unlike other types of rights that maybe your property rights you're, you're accustomed to, it's really the right to, to divert and use waters from the state of the state of Utah. There are a couple of different facets that make up a water right. Um, first of all is the, the defined nature of beneficial use. And in, in Utah, a water right is its basis, its limit, and its measure is beneficial use. So when I talk a, about a water right, I'm going to talk about acres of irrigation or number of stock or number of houses because the beneficial use is really its measure and its basis and its limit, okay? It also has a priority date, and that tells us um, where in line a water right gets its water, you know, how senior it is. Uh, in the West, we kind of live under this concept of prior appropriation, where first in time is first in right. So the people with the most senior rights get their waters before people uh, with more junior rights. We have a defined quantity of water. We typically measure that in cubic feet per second. Uh, we abbreviate that using the acronym CFS. 
or an annual acre foot volume. Essentially, if you can imagine a parcel that is one acre in dimension and filled with water one foot deep, that is an acre foot. There's a specified point of diversion, which is kind of just a fancy way of saying where the water is diverted from the source. So if it's a groundwater, the, the well is the point of diversion. That's where it's taken from the ground and, and diverted. If it's a surface source, like a, a, off of a, a creek or a river, it's going to be the head gate or, or some other type of diversion structure. It might be a spring box and those types of uh, structures, okay? Um, and then has a specified place of use, and that's pretty much what it sounds like. It's where is it being used. We identify that using the public land survey system, uh, the concept of 40-acre tracts within a specific section within a broader township and range. And if you're not familiar with that, uh, we can kind of give you a tutorial on what that means. So usually when we send out that that notice or that summons we get a lot of phone calls and a lot of people will call up and ask you know how do i know if i have a water right you know I, i'm certainly interested in keeping any rights i have so if, how do i know if i have a water right um and we usually answer well it, it, some things that may evidence the existence of a water right on property are wells um, irrigation ditches or head gates and now irrigation ditches are a little bit funny because they may not necessarily mean you have a water right. They may mean that you might have shares in a water company. And we'll kind of talk about what um, the difference is there. Let me see if I can get this to work here. Here we go. So there are a lot of ditches out there, especially in more rural areas in Utah County. Um, you might have one going through your, back your backyard and never even take water out of it. That doesn't mean you have a water right. That means that someone who's built the ditch and is conveying the water and using it somewhere else probably has a water right. Or you may have shares in a water company. So let's distinguish the difference between what a, share, a water share is and a water right. A share in an irrigation company means, just like it's a share in any other company, you own part of the assets of that company. In, in, the, in the sense of a water company or an irrigation company, the company owns the water right, and then they um, issue shares to their shareholders, and those shareholders are able to divert a portion of the water under that water right. And so um, you have shares on one end, which are kind of related to water rights, but not quite what we're talking about, and then water rights, which is what the company owns, okay? Um, also, what we're not talking about are connections to um, municipal uh, systems, okay? Again, the municipality might have a water right, or will certainly have a water right, covering the water they take and they treat and they distribute. But just because you have a connection through your water meter to your home, um, that's not really a water right. But in both of these cases, the irrigation company and the municipal entity, they will be participating on behalf of the shareholder or the customer, respectively, okay? So it's really the irrigation company's requirement to participate in this process, much the same as it is the municipality's uh, requirement to participate. Okay. Um, you know, one thing that's important that, that helps answer the question of why we do this is providing a little bit of historical context. So bear with me. We're going to give you a, a brief history lesson. I'll try to make it as enjoyable as possible. It won't be boring. Uh, hopefully it's not boring. It's not boring to me, but then I'm kind of a water nerd, so let's get on with it. We all know, uh, or we're probably familiar with the story of Brigham Young entering the, the, the Salt Lake Valley July, or actually an advanced party of the Mormon pioneers on July 23rd, 1847. And right away, they started diverting the waters of City Creek so they could soften up the ground and kind of get a late season crop in. Um, you know, and then they built their shopping mall on top of it. <laughs> well, a, about a year later, Brigham Young uh, made a statement that's kind of become the basis of Utah water law. He said, uh, there shall be no private ownership of the streams that come out of the canyons. These belong to the people, all the people. And really that's what water, Utah water rights are. The state of Utah doesn't own the water. The water is a public resource. It belongs to all of us. And so people have the opportunity to appropriate rights to use that water, okay? And so when we talk about the waters of Utah, it's the Division of Water Rights doesn't own it. The state of Utah doesn't own it. We just help administer the orderly distribution of the rights that people have to divert out of it. 
Well, between 1847 and 1850, Utah, what we now know as the state of Utah, went from being part of Mexico um, to this quasi-ecclesiastical state of Deseret to finally the territory of Utah. But those were just you know, imaginary boundary lines changing, right? The, the government of what we now know as Utah remained pretty much church-centric. And when I say church, I'm, of course, referring to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, as a result of that, diversions of water were kind of based on a communal need. So Brigham Young would organize a group of, of Latter-day Saints and send them north or south, east, west. And as they'd arrive at their destinations, they would start diverting the waters and so they could irrigate um, land and develop a crop. And we kind of take that for granted. Like, yeah, of course they're going to divert water out of the canyon and use irrigation. But remember, these, these are folk that had come from the east, right, where water was plentiful. Precipitation provided all the water crops needed. So it was kind of a new thing for them to go and start doing this and diverting waters. And this concept of irrigation was relatively new, and, and actually the Mormons pi pioneered, no pun intended, pioneered the concept of irrigation in the West. Um, but they, these kind of sprung out, the, the need for diverting water kind of developed on a communal basis. Um, as a result of this, the doctrine of priority kind of evolved along with it. Now, I talk about priority. Remember, that's your, your, line, your, your place in line in order of a merit to get your water, okay? Well, you'd have these first group of settlers that would come out and do all the work. They'd dig, dig the main ditches and, and divert the waters of these canyon streams and put a lot of effort into it. But then you'd have follow-on settlers. You know, they would, people would continue to come and establish communities nearby. And, and in order to, to kind of bond in the fellowship of, of the saints at the time, they recognized the need to allow these people also to, to have some of this water. So this concept of primary rights versus secondary rights evolved, where um, those who put the initial labor into the construction of the ditches and the works um, had a primary right. And if there was surplus water, these other settlers would get the surplus um, water. And that kind of evolved along the lines with um, the concept of mining claims, okay? And you're familiar with this, the concept of you go as a, as a, as a miner and you go stake your claim and you have the first claim on, on the, a patch of soil. So you're first in time, first in right. Well, these two concepts kind of melded together in Utah and we have this concept of priority. In some cases, it's a simple primary versus secondary system. Uh, the Provo River is a great example. There's various classes of priority that separate who gets their water first. And then you also have priority dates, which establish what date these uh, uh, appropriator claimed the water. So we have kind of a hybrid system. Um, and again, that concept of primary and secondary rights was originally kind of started in Utah and then made its way in other portions of the Western United States. Um, because the, the diversion of water was kind of centered around church authority, conflicts over those diversions were often settled by an appeal to the local bishop or the local stake uh, high council. So you kind of had bishops, courts would act as um, just, uh, just a, a typical judicial process, and then if they didn't like what the bishop had to say, they'd go and appeal it to the stake high council and they'd make their, their decision. Um, and, and we still find evidence of those today, and I'll talk a little bit here, where the, the, the waters of the Spanish Fork River were originally uh, decreed by a, a, an LDS, or a Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, High Council, and that's still how they're distributed to this day with a few tweaks here and there. Anyway, so let's move on into the territorial era. Well, as you can imagine, Utah becomes a territory. Um, there's a, a, a push to kind of remove the church out of the governing affairs of the territory. As a result of this, the first territorial legislative assembly passed an act that pretty much gave the county court the authority to appropriate waters in the canyons, as well as timber and other things. But in truth, although this was a, a territorial law, uh, Salt Lake County was pretty much the only county that really abode by it. And if you think about it, um, at the time, it was really moot anyways because um, 
the county courts are elected, were elected to fit uh, positions, okay? And you can imagine who people were electing to those positions. They were electing the same people who were their ecclesiastical leaders. So obviously their bishops and their stake presidents would get elected as county court or county, county judges. So in, in truth, although this law was, it was good in concept, it really had little bearing on how water uh, continued to be appropriated. Well, in 1877, the, De the Desert Land Act was passed by Congress, and this is really an incentive um, for people to go out and settle the West. And they kind of gave them some, some ground rules as to how much land they could, um, they could get from the government, but they had, to, they had to irrigate it as a result of, to, in order to get their patent for the, the land, okay? So they're gonna go out and homestead some uh, 160 acres parcel, um, but as part of that, they had, to, they had to actually develop and farm a portion of it. I forget how much. But in order to do that, you can imagine in the West, in the East, that's easy because you have precipitation, it, it falls down. Well, the Desert Land Act gave uh, kind of an implied right for people to divert water from the, the streams, which they were already doing, carry it a long ways away, and use it on soil that was adjacent to a river. In the East, you have this concept of riparian water rights, where if you live next to a river, you have an automatic right to use that river. Well, in the West, this act kind of changed that, saying it wasn't necessarily tied to the land. You could divert water here and use it way over there and still have a right. You didn't have to be right adjacent to the creek or the river in order to obtain that right. Another thing it did through subsequent case laws, it delegated authority to the respective territories or states for the appropriation of water rights. And uh, again, this is one of those things where we think that's a, maybe a, been a foregone conclusion, but you can imagine they still had the government land office issuing patents on homesteading. So you still had to get your property rights through the federal government. So you might consider, well, it would seem natural to do the same thing for water rights. Well, this kind of shook it up saying, no, you get your water rights from the respective territory. And this respective territory or state make the laws with respect to how to appropriate those rights. And so you'll see in the United States, the Western United States, each state has its own little different way to get a water right. Um, 1880, the, you know, the, that law passed for the courts to distribute water. Didn't really work. They tried to fix it. They tried to say, well, what we're going to do is we're going to appoint this, these water commissioners, and they're going to kind of be ex officio judges and issue certificates to people who, who have staked their claims on, this, on these waters. Um, again, it never really took hold. It was actually, I think, ruled um, unconstitutional um, because you kind of have an executive officer making decisions on judicial uh, rights, okay? So instead of the courts um, decreeing rights, you had just kind of this, this executive, executive appointed officer doing it. Well, as a result of that, confusion continued um, in spite of the best efforts of the church or the territorial legislature. And the church continued to administer and decree water rights. Again, this is that same example of the Spanish Fork River in 1879, where the high council made a decision on which companies got what portion of the river. Uh, this is still the same way this, the Spanish Fork River is split to this day with some subsequent decrees and, and modifications, but for the most part, it's still split among those different, those different canal companies based on this high council decision. Let's move on into statehood. Well, as Utah was permitted to enter into the Union as a state, um, there's a lot of debate and discussion as to, do, as to what to do about the water and the water rights. And there was some thought that says, well, what we should do is the state of Utah should just confiscate everyone's water rights and then hand them back out. And of course, that didn't sit well with a lot of the farmers at the time, you know. They had been using this water, they'd become reliant on it. And so there was a big debate. And so what they decided to do out of fear of, of this, they said, fine, we're just not going to do anything. And they didn't pass any type of water law whatsoever except for one measure, and they put it in the Constitution, the state Constitution. It's still there, Article 17. It says, All existing rights to the use of any of the waters in this state for any useful or beneficial purpose are hereby recognized and confirmed. So if, they, if you had been using water prior to the statehood, you were automatically grandfathered in, your right was automatically recognized, and you had no need to, to worry about appropriating a new right. Okay? And these are, some, these are rights that we typically refer to as... Um, 
diligent rights or diligent claims. Sometimes we call them pre-statutory rights, meaning they existed before there was a law with regard to appropriating water rights. And so these are kind of the old timer claims. And you'll see why that's important here in a little bit. Well, in 1897, the Office of the State Engineer was created. Um, it's the predecessor to the Division of Water Rights. That's why I still, we still have kind of this historical title of State Engineer's Office or Assistant State Engineer. Um, but really, he was tasked with conducting hydrographic surveys and really to appropriate a water right, you still had to do this old-fashioned thing and go and stake in your claim at the source and then go and filing something with the county court or the county recorder. And again, those are largely ignored. We have found some good records in Salt Lake City and Salt Lake County um, with regard to some of those old claims. And they've been helpful as we've done this process there, but throughout the rest of the state, these are pretty hit and miss. In 1902, the, the United States Reclamation Service, uh, what we now know as the Bureau of Reclamation, was formed. And for those of you who don't know what the Bureau of Reclamation does, their, their primary mission um, was to reclaim the West. And they do this by building large dams and large reservoirs, which could then be used for people to irrigate and kind of uh, develop and, and um, populate the West. However, the Reclamation Service was really reluctant to go into any state or to do any projects in any state unless there was a comprehensive water law that first said, hey, what rights are already in existence? And second, how rights could be appropriated. And so it's no coincidence that one year later, Utah finally came to, came to their minds and realized, hey, we, we need to have these bureau projects in our state because we depend on irrigation and we want this to happen. And so they developed the first comprehensive water law in 1903. And it was really only for surface waters. So if you wanted to appropriate a water off of the Pro, some water off the Provo River or any of these other surface streams or springs, it gave you a way to do that through the state engineer's office. It also gave, it also provided a way for adjudicating old claims, meaning we could go and find out what the existing claims, all those pre-1990s, 1896 claims were, and bring them onto our record. However, it didn't really provide a good mechanism and it didn't really fund the courts. So they pretty much said the courts are responsible for adjudicating old claims. But those of you who are familiar with the courts, Courts are kind of like, a, you know, you need two parties, two opposing parties to battle it out. You don't just have a judge who's going to say, hey, he's going to wake up one day and like, I'm going to go adjudicate some water rights. I'm going to go find out where these water rights are. You know, judges just like to, they like to rule from the bench, have one party present their part, and their party present their, their story, and they make a, a ruling. Well, the adjudicating water rights didn't really fit that form at the time. And so there was really no effort or nothing done to adjudicate some of these older water rights, these existing um, pre-statutory rights. Well, in 1919, the Utah legislature finally figured that out. Figured that, hey, why is this taking so long? We, you know, this is untenable. We need to find out what these existing rights are. Um, and so they came up with a, a new mechanism. And it was kind of borrowed from the state of, I believe, Oregon or Washington. I can't remember. Um, concept of, hey, what we should do is have the state engineer go out, map all these places, and then submit a recommendation to the court in, a, in an actual civil action as to what the water rights should look like. That way the court, and then he can just join all the parties, everyone who lives in that area, he can join them by a summons and they can come and they can, and then, and then the court can rule on that recommendation. If people don't like the recommendation, they can oppose it. And then it's before the court properly, as opposed to simply a judge wandering around aimlessly looking for water and figuring out how to do water rights, right? And so this is largely how we do it today, that when we talk about a proposed determination, we're talking about the state engineer's recommendation to a court. But again, this was only for surface waters at, the, at this time. They still thought that groundwater was kind of this magic water that just kind of, I, I'm sure they didn't think this. They just thought oh, it was too complicated. Just not, if you want groundwater, just dig your own well and figure it out. Um, you know, and you'd have a lot of these artesian wells because the concept of pumps wasn't quite invented. And so you'd go drill a hole in the ground and, and water would come out. And maybe some of you guys have some of these artesian wells that flow in the early spring or early summer months. Well, in 1935, we finally got smart and said, hey, whether it's water coming out of a creek or water coming out of the ground, it's all the same water. And as a matter of fact, it, ex it interplays with each other. If you drain the groundwater, um, you'll see streams go down. 
uh, and vice versa, okay? And so 1935, you, you needed to have, from there forward, you needed to have a water right to drill a well. Prior to 1935, you could have dr drilled a well without obtaining a water right. So the two dates I want you to kind of key in on are 1903 and 1935. 1903, you needed a water right afterwards for surface rights. 1935, you needed a water right afterwards for groundwater. If you had, if you were using water from either of those prior to those dates, you had a grandfathered right, a diligence claim or, or an underground water claim, kind of lumped together as a pre-statutory claim. So let's talk about why we're doing this and, and why it's important. So prior to the enactment of that 1903 law, water rights kind of fell into a couple different categories. First, there's those that are ecclesiastically decreed. Um, some of those that were just filed for record, you know, the person went and staked their claim, then did the right thing and went to the, the county recorder's office and filed it. And you had those that were decreed by a court. Usually this happened when someone didn't, Someone thought someone else was still in their water and they'd take them to court and then the, a judge would enter a decree and, and probably over-appropriate the stream because the judge had no idea about hydrology or farming or anything. They just threw out a decree and uh, we have a lot of those in Utah. Um, we have contracts or agreements just between parties. You know, there may be no existence of a right, simply an exchange agreement. This happens a lot in the Salt Lake Valley between Salt Lake City and, and private uh, entities. And um, then you had those claims that never, manis never manifested themselves on their record whatsoever. These are the people that were using water. They had no need. They were grandfathered in. What need did they have? And what need do they have today, right? Well, as a result of that, um, there's typically no public record. There certainly wasn't a consolidated public record. For instance, you couldn't go and find out what was happening in Washington County if you wanted to know what the water rights looked like down there. Um, and even if you were in Washington County and you tried to do that, yeah, you're probably pretty sketchy trying to figure that out. Um, since there wasn't any record, over-appropriation was pretty rampant. I, I kind of talked about how sometimes judges would issue decrees which vastly out, uh, overestimated how much water was available in the sources. And because rights weren't defined, they fell in the controversy and they had to be settled through the church process or the court decrees. Um, early on in the, the history of the state engineer's office, he kind of recognized this issue. And at, initially, the idea was, all right, what we're going to do is we're going to figure out all the old water rights first. We're going to figure out who has water rights. And then once we kind of get a handle on that, then we'll start appropriating new water rights. Um, in his, in his 1901-02 biennial report, the state engineer at the time said, Definition of existing rights appears to be of first importance. This is not only necessary to pacify present contention, but to prevent future conflicts and encourage further progress. There can be no safe basis for future work before existing rights are known and made a public record. So the idea is, hey, we'll figure out all the old stuff before we start issuing new stuff. Well, because, again, the legislature didn't provide the funding to the courts and the, it wasn't really a good mechanism, they kind of got tired of waiting for those old rights to get figured out. So they said, uh, we'll figure it out later. Let's just start issuing new water rights. And hopefully we haven't done, we hopefully have over-appropriated the basins, which of course they had. But um, the, 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 we had these two parallel processes, the appropriation process and the adjudication process. The appropriation process would appropriate new water rights, and the adjudication process would help to tie in the existing grandfathered rights into the record. So what is a general stream adjudication? Well, as the name implies, it's an action in court. It's actually an action in state district court. Uh, for, uh, for this specific adjudication, the Utah Lake Jordan River general adjudication, it's in the third district court, as you noted on your summons probably. Um, and it binds all water users and the state engineer. So it's just not limited parties. It's everyone gets bound by this action. And that's why we send notice to everybody. We send it to property owners as well as water right holders just so that everyone's informed and apprised. And we also publish it in the newspaper. Um, that's the title of code. It's governed by if you really want to dig into it. Um, the first general adjudications took, back, took place back in the 20s. You'll recall, remember 1919 is when the state engineer finally got that mechanism called the proposed determination or his recommendation to the court. Well, so 1920s is when he kind of took it to heart and started working on it. Um, he took care of the Weber basin, he took care of the Severe Basin, he even took care of the Virgin River Basin. 
Um, unfortunately, back in those days, you had to pay money in order to participate. And then the court said, well, that's unconstitutional because you're making people pay money in order to assert uh, a, a right. And so the state engineer ran out of money because the legislature hadn't funded him. So he kind of stopped adjudicating for a while. Until the 1930s, there was a huge drought. You, recall, you, you may recall the history of the Dust Bowl. You know, there was, it was the Depression. There was a lot of drought. And the drought was uh, felt here in Utah as well. And you had a lot of people on the Jordan River who were uh, throwing pumps in or diverting water out of the Jordan River illegally because they needed to irrigate their fields. And Salt Lake City said, I have had enough of this. Um, these people can't take the water out of the Jordan River. We own a lot, most of the water in the Jordan River. So what we're going to do is tell the state engineer he needs to do a general adjudication. They attempted to do that. The state engineer said, I'm broke, can't do it. So the Salt Lake City said, fine, if you're not going to do it, I'm just going to sue 2,000 people. And so they, there's this civil court case. Um, begins with the number 36, indicating that's the year it began, 1936 which is, you'll find the civil number on all of our summons here. It's the same court case. They, they took it to court, and the court said, hey, Salt Lake City, we get it, um, but you can't do this. There's a statutory process for adjudicating water rights. And because of the, the mounting uh, government, uh, kind of the pressure from Salt Lake City, the legislature finally coughed up some funds and gave the state engineer some money in order to start adjudicating the Utah Lake Jordan River General Adjudication, which is the one we're talking about. We're, we're talking about the Provo City North, but it's just a little bite size of this big purple blob right here that started in 1936. I often get asked, well, why are we doing it now? Why are you guys here? Does it have to do with the Walmart down the street or some development? You know, they're they trying to grab our water. And the answer is, it's just your time. We've, we've, sight, we've kind of done some uh, some efforts in the Salt Lake Valley. We've finished up the Salt Lake Valley. We're kind of moving our way down the Provo Orem area, and then we're going to move ourselves up the Provo River drainage up into Heber. So it's just your turn, I guess, is, is the answer to that. So why do we conduct general adjudications? We want to bring all claims on the record. Remember this guy simply irrigating without a care in the world. Uh, we want to make sure that he brings his claim onto the record. We want to know if you have a pre-statutory right so that we know where we're at hydrologically speaking with regard to the, the waters within our state so that we know how bad we are over-appropriated or whether we are over-appropriated. And so those include surface rights, which we typically call diligence claims, and underground water claims, which are kind of the, if you had a well prior to 1935, you'll see those two dates, 1903, 1935. And I just lump them under pre-statutory claims. Another thing that is very not well known, but very significant portion of why we do this are these things called Federal Reserved Water Rights. And it has nothing to do with the Federal Reserve that prints money. It actually um, is a result of an old Supreme Court case back in the turn of the, the century. There's a, um, a tribe on the Fort Belknap Indian Reservation, and you'll recall the Desert Land Act gave authority to the respective states for appropriating water rights. Well, this, these, this Indian Reservation, these Native Americans said, well, if you're going to try and force us to be agrarian, we need some water in order to develop crops. So they went to their state engineer in Montana, the equivalent of the state engineer, and said, hey, you know, the federal government has put us on this reservation, told us to become farmers. We're here to appropriate some water. And the state engineer of Montana pretty much said, well, tough luck. It's all appropriated. All these farmers around you were here before you, or they've, they, they got wise before you, and they appropriated all the waters of the Milk River. Well, you can imagine that didn't sit well with the Native Americans. They took it to court. And there's a Supreme, it made its way all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court ruled that by virtue of the fact that the federal government had taken um, that reservation out of the public domain or had reserved it out of the public domain for a specific cause, that there was an implied water right associated with that. And that an implied water right had um, as much water as it needed to satisfy the purpose of the reservation, and it had a priority date equal to the date that it was taken out of the reservation. And you may say, well, that's all great. What does that have to do with the state of Utah? Well, we know we, we do have a few Indian, Indian reservations, but more importantly, 
this doctrine, this doctrine of federal reserve rights was applied to other types of federal reservations like forest service reservations, military reservations, BLM grounds, um, national monuments, national parks. So all of these federal reservations have implied water rights. And you might say, well, how much water is, do they need in the forest? And that would be a great question. The problem is the federal government enjoys this thing called federal sovereign immunity, right? You can't sue them unless they let you sue them. It's kind of a weird thing. I can't imagine um, whoever thought that up. But you, you, the, unless the federal government allows you to sue them, you can't take them to court. Well, there was a senator in Nevada who said that's not fair. What we're going to do is we're going to draft some legislation in Congress. And we're going to call it the McCarran Amendment. And essentially what it does, it waives the federal government's uh, so federal sovereign immunity with respect to general water rights adjudications. And that took place back in 1952. So if we go back to this map, you'll notice a lot of these took place subsequent to 1952 because finally you guys like, heck yeah, we're, we can figure out how much water the Forest Service needs now. We can tell them to bring their claims forward. And the interesting thing is, not only do they, does it force them to do that, but they have to do it in state district court. It doesn't, it's not done in a federal court, which is a really strange thing for a lot of the Department of Justice attorneys to, to realize that they are, they are doing this, they are, they are uh, litigating this in a state district court venue. So it's important, a general adjudication forces, let's say the Forest Service, which owns all of this right above us, right? all of like the Rock Canyon area, you know, they have these unquantified claims. It forces them to quantify them and bring them before the state engineer for evaluation and recommendation to the court. Without those, we would never know what those claims are in the federal government. That would always be kind of a cloud over the water rights picture. We'd never really know where we're at. Um, also, you know, Indian reservations and, and military installations. Uh, Tipinogos has a national monument, so it has its own Federal Reserve water right. So all of these little things that can amount up to a lot of water in the long run. All right, another th reason we do general adjudications to avoid multiplicity of suits. We don't want everyone suing each other. We kind of just want to rip off the hangnail in one fell swoop. So we just get everyone together and said, we're just going to hammer this out and get it over with. Um, okay, here's the more controversial. This is usually where the questions start coming because usually it's no one will ask a question until someone finally asks one question then everyone feels more comfortable. So another part of Western water law and regardless of which state you go into is this concept of re use it or lose it. And the reason behind this is because there's only a limited amount of water. I think we can all agree that there's a bigger demand for water than there is actual physical wet water, right? We live in an arid state, uh, second driest in the Union. So Utah's no exception to that rule. Well, when, the, when our original, um, you know, the legislature came up with this 1903 law, realize that, hey, what we don't want is someone to appropriate large blocks of water and then hold a monopoly on it and force people to come to them at high rates uh, in order to get water. And so they developed this concept of use it or lose it. That if you don't use your water right within over a, at the time it was a seven year period, it went seven, then went to five, then back to seven. So we're now back at seven years. So if you don't use your water right within seven years, it's subject to forfeiture. Now people can say, hey, well, that's not fair. You know, how can the state do that to me? Um, and I think the problem is you don't see it from the other angle, right? The, keep in mind, let's, and I usually do this by virtue of an example, a theoretical example. If there's a gentleman who owns um, a water right for 100 acres off of Provo River and decides to stop using that water right for a period of time, well, that water is still going downstream, and it's being used by people who have junior rights. So that water doesn't just go and get saved and vanish because he's not using it. It's continuing to be used by people. And as a matter of fact, it's not only continuing to be used, but people become reliant on that water. So you can imagine how disruptive it would be if suddenly that same gentleman who owned that 100 acres of irrigation finally woke up one day, you know, 50 years later, and said, by golly, I'm going to take my right, and I'm going to... I'm going to uh, impair all these people who have become reliant on this water, who have built homes on the, on this, in the expectation of this water. So really that's the purpose of this concept of use it or lose it. We have a finite resource. It's, we want to incentivize use of your rights rather than 
um, monopolizing it or cause being disruptive by not using it for so long and then turning it on at the last minute when people have become reliant on it. So um, if you feel like you fall in that category, um, you can talk to me later and then we can kind of explore the contours of what that means to you. But uh, at the end of the day, if a water right was once an alfalfa field and now it's a, a Walmart parking lot, it's probably not going to get recognized. It's probably going to get rec recommended to the court that it, that it go away. And it doesn't go into my back pocket, doesn't go in the state's back pocket, doesn't get sold off. It just goes away. It just becomes invalid. Um, last thing we want to do is obtain a final decree on all the water rights. When you appropriate a water right, uh, you can file proof on it and get a certificate on it, which is kind of prima facie evidence that you have a right. It's like as good as you can get without getting one step better, which is the court decree, which is an actual water right. And so at the end of this, we want to um, get all rights decreed by the court. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the process. These are just thumbnail sketches. I am going to delve into the more important ones uh, that have in meaning to you over the next few weeks. Um, we'll talk about the next steps that you'll need to take in much more detail, but just bear with me. This is going to be kind of a, a quick east to west, east coast to west coast type of thing. So we've already kind of gone through steps one through four. Today is step number four, our public meeting. Um, the petition was actually the court telling us that, hey, in 1936, uh, Salt Lake, you can't sue all these people. The state engineer's prerogative to do a general adjudication. So that's really what kicked this off. We sent notice, we published notice in the newspaper, in the, in the Daily Herald. Um, we also published summons in the Daily Herald as well as we sent everyone summons in a, in a mailing. And tonight we're doing this public meeting. So the next few steps are summarized here. We're going to, in a few weeks from now, we're going to send out notice to file claims. Again, I will cover this much more in depth in just a few more slides, so bear with me if I go quick. Um, those claims that for which no, those rights for which no claim is filed will end up on a list of unclaimed rights. Um, people, we will publish that, send notice to everyone. The same people who receive notice tonight will get notice of that. People will have 90 days to object to that list. Again, much more detail here in the next couple slides. I will have a public meeting like this to explain it. If, uh, if the rights remain on that list, that list gets decreed as abandoned. So that's why it's important for you to participate if you have a claim to file. Otherwise, it could risk being uh, decreed abandoned by the court. Um, of course, we have to resolve any objections before we can get that decree. Um, but again, if those are pretty straightforward, if you feel like you just failed to uh, file a claim, you just do an objection. We don't argue it. We just said, yep, that's fine. Let them file their claim. You come in. And then we investigate your claim. We make a recommendation. So what we'll do is if people file a claim, we'll, my team will come out and they'll meet with you, we'll review your claim, uh, make sure they got a correct location for the point of diversion, whether that be a well or a head gate or anything like that. They'll map the irrigated acreage if it's irrigation or they'll identify the uses. And then they'll put it in a recommendation. They'll, they'll take your water user's claim and they'll compile a proposed determination. Again, code word for recommendation to the court from the state engineer. So we'll get all our recommendations, we'll put it in one publication, um, we'll, we'll, we will mail notice out to everyone. Uh, actually, only people who file a claim will get notice of this. So if you are a property owner, you have no interest in this, you don't fail, file a claim, you won't get notice of this unless you tell me, hey, I want to get notice of this. Um, they have 90 days to object, we'll have a public meeting, and then the court finally issues a final decree on that subdivision, which will simply say, state engineer's proposed determination is correct, except for these changes which may have been raised as a result of any objections that were filed, okay? Again, I fully recognize that that was a very fast cover, and I will talk more in depth here. Yes, ma'am. So this, so these two, the list of unclaimed rights is, will be, what will happen is we will send you a letter with a URL, a web link that will take you to it and it will just, it'll be just a list, a, a PDF on our website that you can look at, um, you can print it off. Same thing with the proposed determination. Back in the days we used to actually print these off and mail them to people but it was just too expensive. And so um, we now just send a notice out with how you can gain access to it. Yes sir.
Yes, yeah, so in addition to being recorded and you'll be able to view me stumble through this presentation again tomorrow and the next day or whenever, um, we are, we will, I'll take these slides, I'll put them in a PDF format and they'll be available on our website as well. And I'll show you how to access that after this meeting if you wanna see, it's not super intuitive, but pretty clear. All right, let's keep on driving. Okay, so the next step for you guys is to be, if you are interested in filing a claim, is to file your water user's claim, okay? So what will happen um, in September, I don't want to give a date because I can't remember, I think it's September 4th, we're going to send out a notice to file claims, all right? And we're also going to publish it in the newspaper. So if you receive the summons packet for this meeting, if you're here tonight and you receive that summons packet, you'll receive one of these. Um, now there's two different formats. If you're simply a property owner and we don't have a record of you owning a water right, you'll receive a notice to file a claim along with a blank water user's claim form. We'll have the form with nothing filled in. However, if we have record of your water right, we'll send you a claim that's already filled out with the, the information on our records. Okay, you'll have all the, the flow information, the location, the point of diversion, all those types of things. Now, if you receive a blank claim and you just don't know what to do with it, that's fine. That's, that's normal. You're a normal person, okay? Take stock in that, if nothing else, because they're really complicated. But that's what we, uh, the Division of Water Rights, are here to help you do, is to, to fill that claim form out. So you can give us a call, you can come into our office, whatever you need to do, we'll help you f fill that claim out if you feel like you have a water right that you need to claim. Once you receive, or once we mail out that notice, um, you have 90 days to file your claim. And you can either do that by mailing the claim back into the Division of Water Rights, driving and handing it to us, or if you really want to get fancy, you can, you can file it with the third district court. Um, it's just easier, in my opinion, if you come in and we'll help you f fill out the claim and then you just give it to us and we stamp receive. There's no fee or anything, it's just um, filing it with us. Heck, you can even scan it and email it to me and it, using that email address shown earlier and I'll, we'll do that just fine, it's not a big deal. Um, there is an opportunity, if you feel like 90 days isn't quite enough, you can request an extension and by, if you do so, again, just using that email address and say, I need a 30-day extension, um, you, have to, you have to request that extension before the 90 days expires, but that's just automatically granted, okay? So just by virtue of you requesting it, you automatically get it. So you get 120 days in total to file a claim if you need it. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so I noticed that you had a blank water user's claim. I think you may be in a different subdivision. I'm not sure why you have your, I have to look at yours a little, because I noticed when you brought it, came up to me, I was like, how does she already have the claim? So there's something screwy going on. Usually the rest of you shouldn't have a claim yet. Um, but yeah, we'll look at yours. Um, you may have received notice from the previous subdivision, the, the Provo City South, and because we recently sent out the notice to file claims for that. So there may be some confusion. Yes, sir. Okay, so the question was, and I'm, I've been a terrible <laughs> AV guy, I'm supposed to repeat the question. His question is, um, how does the certificate that they have fit with this? And my, it, it depends. If you're talking about a certificate of shares, meaning you have shares in an irrigation company, versus, or if you have a certificated water right. So we'll talk about shares in an irrigation company first, okay? If you have a share certificate in an irrigation company, you say it's Fort Field or some other irrigation company, um, it really won't play into this because if you have shares in that company, they are the ones who are responsible for uh, responding to this notice to file a claim. Does that mean you can just kind of check out and not worry about it? You can. However, I know that some of these ir some irrigation companies are more robust than others. Some of them are just kind of have a shoestring budget and you know it's just someone's part-time gig not even getting paid in order to run the thing so you may want to as a shareholder ensure that the company is responding to this notice and filing a claim for their water right and quite frankly if they call up and say hey i'm fort field irrigation company we need to file a claim on our water rights we should know how to help you we should 
know what water right you're talking about. Uh, Fort Field has a decreed water right out of the Provo River, those types of things. So shareholders, really their responsibility is to make sure that the board for the company are participating. Now, if you're talking about a certificated water right, meaning you appropriated a water right, you then filed proof on the water right, you received a certificate of, uh, you know, in essence, becoming a perfect water right, um, the water user's claim will reflect the information on that certificate. So those are the two certificates we're talking about. I suspect you're talking about the share certificate, right? But if that helps anyone else, hopefully it did. All right. Once we receive your claims, um, you know, we, my teams are working on multiple subdivisions simultaneously, so it may not be an immediate response, but they're going to reach out to you. Hopefully in the claim, you'll put your phone number or your email address, and they can reach out and schedule a time to come review your claim. And they'll come, they'll bring the claim. They'll probably have a preconceived idea of what you're talking about. They'll look at your your property on aerial imagery and, and come to some conclusions, but they'll come out, look at the well, take some photos, write some notes down, and then they'll make an, a recommendation, and they'll they'll mail that recommendation to the respective claimant. So they'll, they'll mail it to you so you can see what we're thinking before we file it with the court, okay? Let's talk about the list of unclaimed rights. So back at the Division of Water Rights in Salt Lake City, we have this gigantic file room. And what it has, it has all the water rights that we know of in the state of Utah. We call these water rights or owners of record, okay? Water rights of record. Um, so if you appropriated a water right through the state engineer's office and perfected it, we would have record of it. So when I talk about the list of unclaimed rights, I'm only talking about those water rights we have a record of. There may be water rights or rights to the use of water for people who had a well drilled prior to 1935 and never filed a claim until now, okay? That is not what I'm talking about because we wouldn't know that existed until you filed a claim. But if there are for instance, in this area, we have about 160 water rights of record in this. If you look at this map that maybe you, some have seen, you'll see a bunch of dots and numbers. Those are the water rights we know of. And so the list of unclaimed rights is really for any right that we know of on our records for which no claim was filed, okay? So if no one filed a claim against that right, it's going to end up on this list. And we're going to send out notice to everyone. And you can look through it and say, yeah, I, oh, my, for some reason, my right got ended up on here. I better do something about it. We'll hold a public meeting. And if you happen to fall in that category where you just spaced it or something, you know, went askew or you just didn't have time or maybe, um, you know, I've had people who are on serving missions or something like that and just didn't get the notice in time or didn't understand it. They can file an objection, and what they do is they, they just, and it's pretty straightforward, but they got to file it with the court, write a narrative saying, hey, um, I failed to file a claim during the required time frame because of this or this, and here is my water user's claim. And they're supposed to also mail one to, to, this, to us as well. So they file that with the court, the third district court. And the instructions on the list of unclaimed right are, are provided for you to know how to do this. But you do that, and traditionally, we don't really fight it. Um, you know, we want people to file claims. And so if there's some mitigating reason why you failed to file a claim, we understand it. We get it. Life's busy. And this isn't the most important thing in your lives at the moment, I'm sure. Um, we have the option to litigate it if we just think it's completely ridiculous or if someone's trying to um, file claims for the entire list of unclaimed rights. Um, you know, so, but for the most part, we just accept it. They file a claim. It's no big deal. The court's removes the water right from the list of unclaimed rights and then we just evaluate it as we would any other right. And then we receive, once we kind of get all the objections resolved, once all of those claims are resolved, um, the court will issue a decree stating that those rights on that list, on the list of unclaimed rights, are considered abandoned. Um, they're considered abandoned because people have failed to participate or failed to claim on them. And so also as a result of this, um, if you remember the Dosecki's guy that just failed to file a claim for 100 years, if he continues to fail to file a claim, he won't be able to file a claim there any time after that. Okay? So in essence, at that time, the court also issues a decree saying, hey, you diligence claim owners, you underground water claim owners, your chances are up. You're no longer able to use that water. You have no more right. So that is one of the purposes. It kind of buttons up those unknown claimants out there. 
The proposed determination, I've kind of already talked about it, it represents our recommendation to the court. So we'll take all the claims, we'll evaluate them, we'll make an assessment, we'll mail you a copy of what we think our recommendation is going to look like, and then we'll put them all together in one um, proposed determination. We will mail notice to those who have filed claims or showed an interest in participating. We'll hold another public meeting, um, just as we are today. Um, again, people will have 90 days to file an objection. For instance, if we, if you filed a claim stating you had 10 acres of irrigation, we come out and we say, oh, we only see five acres of irrigation, and that's what ends up in the proposed determination. You can then file an objection saying, no, the state engineer missed these five acres over here. And then we would go in and we'd either try to negotiate, we'd try to settle it. If we made an honest mistake, we, rec we recognize it. You know, we're not in this to get it wrong. We want people to have the correct, uh, we want the record to be correct. So if you're irrigating with your water right, the full amount, then we want to recognize that. But in some instances, and I know it's hard to believe, people try to claim something that they don't have or try to trick us or, you know, be a little bit um, devious. Uh, with respect to water rights because it's all about the the cash right water rights are worth money and so people are obviously interested in in either capitalizing on uh, water rights that no longer exist or maximizing water rights which maybe have partially been forfeited long ago um, so we may end up litigating that um, and obviously we'll go before the court and we'll provide our evidence and the objector will provide their evidence and then the court will make a decision as to who's right and who's wrong and we have to resolve all those objections before we can get a final decree in the proposed determination. In essence, the court makes a final judgment, says the proposed determination is the way these rights are, with the exception of these other issues that we resolve through the objection process, and he incorporates those in, and then everyone gets a, a decreed water right. Here's the Provo City North subdivision boundary. You may have seen this map on your um, notice. Um, it kind of follows the Provo River here to the west, and then just kind of the drainage line of Rock Canyon up into that little pocket, and then down here along, was that 800 north? Yeah, um, just a, kind of an arbitrary street line there. Um, we kind of draw these subdivisions to, we try to keep them as hydrologically isolated as possible, you know, try to keep them within drainages. Um, in more urban areas, we just pick roads, figuring that, you know, either a well's got to be on one side of the road or the other side of the road. We don't really want to cut the well in half. Um, I mentioned earlier the number of water rights of record, around 180. Um, we sent out about 7,000 notices to property owners and water right owners um, for this meeting. I think we probably have about 100 people here, maybe. Um, here are the issues in the anticipated timeline. Uh, often people, one of our biggest issues is outdated title. Okay, so a lot of times people will have older homes. The original homeowner will have appropriated a water right for a well or something else in their backyard. And then they've moved on, they've sold their house. The new person who has bought the house um, takes ownership dies and sells it and it goes through a bunch of transactions till present day and you're the owner of this house and you are the certainly the owner of the property and probably the owner of the water right however our records still reflect the original person who appropriated the water right because our records don't automatically update with the county records office um, so that may be the case you may have received at your residence if you are a water right owner of record a notice um, that has your address but has someone else's name on it okay so that might be the case. Um, we can certainly show you how to update title, but just know that that's not necessary. We certainly encourage it, but you still have the opportunity to participate. We just simply say you're just claiming, you're a claimant, but you're gonna preserve the water right moving forward and you can update title to it later on our records. Then we have this, um, this concept of the, these water rights that we refer to as no proof required. Uh, back in the 40s and 50s, um, you'll recall that when you appropriate a water right, you're required to file proof that you've actually put the water right to beneficial use. That usually requires a surveyor or an engineer to do that proof. They usually have to draw a map and they have to file the proof on your behalf. Well, in the 40s, there weren't a whole lot of engineers or surveyors because they're all fighting 
Japanese and the Nazis in, in World War II. And so the state of Utah said, hey, well, since we don't have a whole lot of these guys floating around, what we're going to do is if it's a small amount of water, we're not going to require proof. And that was great. It allowed a lot of people to appropriate water rights without a whole lot of issues, a lot of hoops to jump through. However, what it didn't do is um, often when people would appropriate water rights, they'd simply kind of get it as best they could on a map and say, this is where I want to drill my well. And there was no subsequent check on that through a surveyor or an engineer saying, this is the exact spot where they drilled their well. And that would happen by a survey and they'd tie that to a section corner or something. Well, as a result of this, you may see these dots on this map or on our database, and they may not be perfectly located. Some of that has to do with these, these no proofs required, but it also has to do with just um, maybe bad surveys, maybe our GIS, um, geographic information systems uh, interfaces, not perfect or doesn't line up with the survey. So there's a number of reasons. The bottom line is don't take for granted where they say that point of diversion is located. So if you go, and I'll show you on our, our map interface how to get that, it might show a well located in the middle of a house or in the middle of a street. Just kind of take it with a grain of salt and say, yeah, it's probably, that's probably the water right, but it's really located here. When we come through and we evaluate the water rights, we'll fix it at that time. Anticipated timeline, we kind of talked about um, notice to file claims. It's going to be early September. I think September 4th is the date, but don't quote me on that. Just know that it's first week of September. Um, that's when the 90-day claim filing period will begin. In December, that's when that claim filing period will conclude. So you'll have that 90 days to file the claims. We'll begin investigating as best we can during the winter or we may, may carry on into the spring and summer. Um, in March 2020, we will publish the list of unclaimed rights. Um, in June, you'll, that's when that opportunity to object will conclude for the list of unclaimed rights. And then August 2021 is probably when we're looking at having the earliest we'll have a proposed determination done. Um, the reason for that is, is we're going to try and go up the canyon and get all these rights associated with the Provo River uh, consistent. And so we're kind of delaying the publication of these books down in this area until we can kind of figure out what the rights on the Provo River look further up at Nehiber in Midway. So that's why it's taking so long to publish a proposed determination. Um, and then 90 days after the publication of that proposed determination, obviously the, the objection period for that will conclude. Um, here's the biggest question you usually get, will I lose my water right? Uh, so if you are a water right holder and you're currently using your water right within the, the conformance of the division records, you have nothing to worry about um, as long as you file your claim. If you don't have a water right of record, meaning you have one of these pre-statutory rights, you have a, a well that was drilled in 1912 or whatever, you need to file your claim, otherwise you risk being barred from ever asserting that water right in the future. Um, if the water user use authorized of the water has fallen out of use for a period of seven years or more, it may be subject to being recommended to the court that it be forfeited or a portion of it. So if it was a, near, a water right for 10 acres and you're only irrigating two acres, we're going to recommend that the court recognize the two acres. So you'll kind of get a haircut of that eight acres of irrigation. Who do I contact? That's me at the top. My deputy who's not here tonight. Uh, it's Gary Brimley. But Josh Zimmerman's really the guy you'll want to contact. He's going to be the team leader. He's going to be directing the boots on the ground, um, the staff. This is Josh back here in the green shirt and tie and beard, handsome-looking gentleman. Um, he's going to be your go-to guy, and, and he'll be able to uh, really get to the crux of any questions you have. Now, with that said, I'm going to go to my email and see if uh, we have any online viewers that have... Uh, submitted any questions and uh, let me see I don't see anything so are there any questions from the group let's start here and then we'll, we'll start but yes sir on the front row
had a list of every property on there, about 1,200 acres. Look, that was what point I know of. They got to in uh, 1985. I'm wondering if I could find out if they've done any more survey, if they've had anything more advanced at this point. When, when you say survey, are you talking about a, like an actual land survey, or are you talking about a water rights survey? Or yeah. So his question has to do with some survey activity in the Salt Lake County. Um, why don't we talk offline? And I, uh, uh, yeah, I think I think we have some tools online that would be helpful that you could use that, to answer that. Okay, let's talk offline. Then there's a gentleman behind you. Then I'll get I'll get to you, sir. So he wants me to clarify whether if he has shares, whether he has rights. And I'm, the answer is kind of. And I wish I could give you the clarity you seek. So it just kind of depends. We're, we're, we're kind of being pedantic on the these use of these words. So do you have the right to use water? Yes. Do you have a water right? No. The company owns the water right. Okay. So when you say, do I have rights? May, yes, depends on what you mean by the term right. So if you have a share in a company, you can certainly use the water right that that company owns, but you don't own the water right. You can't take that water and say it's mine. It belongs to the company, okay? So I'm, I'm not sure if that's clear enough, but as it relates to the adjudication, we aren't looking at individual shareholders per se. We might use shareholders information or we, the company might say these are our shareholders this is how they're using their water and then we might say okay we're going to take all the individual shareholders and map out what acreage each of those shareholders are using to come to a grand total of what the water right that's owned by the company is at you know quantify it so yes you do have a right to use the water but you don't own a water right in the sense that i'm using it here tonight is that help give you some finality let me know I and mean, we can talk afterwards yes sir okay Yes, uh, to, so 
let me uh, just hit some of the points that you refer to. You, you asked, uh, or I, I believe you asked, whether this is going to involve the entire Utah Valley, and it is. Um, we've already adjudicated, for instance, Goshen and, and certain areas of Utah Valley. We're primarily working along kind of the eastern side, and then we'll, we'll circle back and kind of hit further south a little bit. But um, you're right, it's the entire Utah Lake Jordan River general adjudication. So it's areas west of Utah Lake, south of Utah Lake, that fall anything, if you, you made a little drop of water and it eventually made its way into Utah Lake or into the Jordan River, we're going to adjudicate it, okay? So it does, and it is a lengthy process, and it is complicated. Um, and I'm happy to uh, present at any meetings you have amongst your agricultural commission. Happy, or happy to have Josh come and present to you, even if, you know, I'm sure you'd be happy to do that. Um, but whatever we can do to facilitate the dialogue, because that is important. It's important for everyone to be on the same sheet of music. So, And we want people to protect their rights and the agricultural uh, um, you know, agriculture is a big part of that, right? And it's usually the agriculture, ag agricultural community who are more aware of these types of things because their livelihood depends on it. So happy to work with you and, and facilitate whatever questions you have. Well, I'm definitely optimistic. I mean, it's only taken, what, 90 some odd years to get this far, but um, to be truthful, uh, we've had some changes to the statute and some funds dedicated, so we are expediting it, but you're right. I, I do think um, it will take more than a few years, uh, certainly, uh, and I wasn't trying to be over optimistic, but I'm also, I think I'm being realistic. We have a pretty good grasp. I mean, I've been looking at this area for the last seven years so I've already got seven years into it so let's if I count that towards any of it you know we did the bird's eye area just and it took me the first seven years of my career to get bird's eye figured out um, but we have some good people we have the Provo River Commissioner here tonight he's provides some great insights and as well as the old uh, Provo River Commissioner so we're trying to use all our tools to figure it out but you're right it's going to be a lot of pick and shovel work and it's going to be complicated but you know if we can't do it who else can do it so we're going to keep on at it is there any other questions for the good of the group otherwise i'm happy to take them offline you guys can either talk to my team outside or come on up there is a one other i'd like to show you just some features on our website that might be helpful in navigating your your own investigation in your own water rights okay so bear with me just a few more minutes i'm just going to show you really quick how to access our website how to access this inner online interface okay oh there's me oh, geez. how do i get that off so that's where you would go and view this if you wanted to see it tomorrow or whatever all right so this is our website um, waterrights.utah.gov. I talked a little bit about an online mapping interface where you could look for water rights on your own property. I'm going to take you through our website on how to get there, okay? So if you can follow along, if you see this, the, the easiest way to get there is this little icon down here. It says map search, okay? It's on the right hand side of the web page. Right there, it has a little map icon by it. I click that and it'll bring up an aerial image of the state of Utah along with several different um, radio buttons and uh, menus on the right hand side. What I'm going to do first is because uh, we have thousands of points of diversion throughout the city of Utah, I'm just going to turn the points of diversion layer off first, okay? And I also just kind of give you guys some situational awareness of what we're talking about when we talk about general adjudications and how big a job it is. Keep in mind that every corner of the state is covered by one of these subdivisions, okay? We're talking about the Utah Lake Jordan River. All these purple lines represent different subdivisions, and some of them aren't even subdivided. So let me zoom in just a little bit. And you can see that uh, we're talking about the 55-7 area. So that's the area code 
the, the 55 is the division code, and the 7 is the book code. So 55-7 is the Provo City North subdivision. I'm just going to go ahead and zoom in. And I'm going to turn on the points of diversion layer again, okay? So let's go over here to, the, um, to all these fields. And you'll just turn on this, this button that says points of diversion. And what you'll see is a lot of red and blue dots pop up. The blue dots represent surface diversions, so water rights that are associated with surface sources like streams or springs, okay? The red icons, they have little wells on them. Those are associated with underground sources, so typically wells. Um, these ones that are kind of clouded over, that means there's multiple rights covered under one point of diversion. Usually when you see that, that's kind of a municipal well, probably that has multiple rights in one well. So you can have a lot of different water rights coming out of one well. It's not necessarily one well per right. But let's go on, let's go on over here, and we're just going to pick on this guy right here, 55-828. So that's what, when we talk about water right number or file jacket number, that's what we're referring to, okay? It has the area code or the division code, 55, and then just maybe a... a a one to five digit number after it, okay? So these are all unique numbers. So if I select that icon, it'll bring up some information, just kind of a brief summary of the description of this water right. So this water right, this is a water right number, its status, and this is kind of more of, for me, I would understand this probably better than, than you guys, but you see this, this nomenclature at the end. This means it's an application that's no proof required, meaning that this was applied for a long time ago, back in 1956. Um, that's the priority date. They didn't require proof. So that kind of when I hear that, I think, okay, take the point of diversion with a grain of salt wherever it's located, and let's see where, let's see where it is. And you can kind of zoom in as far as you can zoom in. And I'm going to turn on a different base map just for a little bit clearer, clearer picture, okay? Now, that well may be located there or it might be located over here or over here in someone else's property because it's a no proof required for all we know. But I'm going to select the image again or the icon again. And if I want to know more information, I can actually go up to this hyperlink of the water right number and it will take, us, take you to the division's website, our database, and it will it'll show all the information we have for this particular water right. And so this is just kind of summarizes some of the data that we have. So for instance, this water right was appropriated, as I said, um, back in 1956 for the uses of, I can't read it off the screen, um, irrigation, domestic, and other, a swimming pool, right? So these are the uses. So 0.27 acres, one EDU, that's what we call an equivalent domestic unit. Think of a house, and then some other. And so that's the extent of the water right, the beneficial use of the water right. And if you really got um, curious, you can go up here, and there's a, dock, a drop down. You can actually, oh, actually, it's this right here, the old school system. Um, you hit this tab. And it'll give you a list of all the scanned documents we have in this water right file back at the division website. And you can go through them and you can see if, you're really, if you really want to dig into what this water right and it'll have a lot of information, okay? So this one doesn't, this is an irrigation company. This is, oh, it may or may not. Some irrigation companies keep those shareholder lists to themselves, don't put them on the division records, okay? But yeah, it will say, if it, if for instance, if it was Fort Field, it would say Fort Field Irrigation Company here and the ownership information. Um, usually my experience has been that um, irrigation companies are reluctant to place shareholder information on a website that's accessible by the public because an uh, irrigation company is a private entity and they don't really like their shareholders being um, public. But it's up to the, share it's up to the company. Um, if we go back to the map, um, some other features. If you're not very good at navigating, so you can, go, you can choose several different types of maps if you'd like. 
But if you're not very good at navigating aerial imagery or maps, trying to figure out where your house is, you can come down here to this drop down. So under the search tab, and you pull down and you can actually just enter your address. Does anyone have a particular address they want me to see if they, nothing? Okay, I'm just gonna, well, let's do, I don't know, we'll try this one. I have no idea where this is, maybe Provo. Yeah, that's what I thought. Well, I know where one is. We'll just do the division of water rides because I know that's a valid address. And it will take you right to a place of big X where the address is and you can zoom out and you can see if there's any wells or anything in that general area. Okay. Um, one last feature of our website, just want to show it to you. So I'm going to go back to just the home page. So where you will find this presentation. To find the recording of it, you just go down to training videos. Give us a day or two to get it uploaded and, and placed on there. Um, that's where you will find that. If you wanted to find um, the PowerPoint presentation, just the PDF of the slides, you would go to meetings and go to past meetings and you'd find it there. Okay, you just select one of the hyperlinks. Here's the, the Provo City South public meeting we held back on August 16th or July 16th. And it will have this, it will have a link to the live streaming of the video and it will have um, the presentation slides down there. So that's pretty much it. Are there any questions that my navigation of the web interface prompted? If not, um, this concludes my presentation. I'm happy to hang out for a little bit, maybe 10 minutes or so, um, and answer any questions you have. Thank you. No applause necessary. Yay, it's over.